Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In this lecture, we are going to be talking about the ideal gas law and how gases perform and behave under ideal circumstances. So let's go ahead and get started. And what we have are first of all, what is a gas? Well, gases are composed of atoms or molecules. So some gases are composed of individual atoms such as argon, neon or helium. Other gases are composed of molecules which are more than one atom bound together. And that is like nitrogen and oxygen which make up the majority of our atmosphere. The oxygen we breathe is not molecular is not sorry not atomic oxygen single molecules but is molecular oxygen with two oxygen atoms bound together. Now gases as we know are very easily compressed and we can compress gases because their particles are very spread out relative to their size. There is a lot of space between the molecules within a gas. So there's a lot of space between these, meaning that you can compress them closer together and still have room when you have liquids or solids. The, the molecules are much, much closer together. And we will talk sometimes about standard temperature and pressure called STP. And those are zero degrees Celsius and 1.01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. So this is the temperature standard. This is the standard pressure. So if we say that something is at standard temperature and pressure, we are giving you those two bits of information. We're saying that the temperature is zero degrees Celsius and that the uh, pressure is 1.01 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. So let's go ahead and look a little more about gases and what we see. Uh, first of all, looking at an example and looking at the relationship between three properties of a gas, the pressure, the temperature and the volume. And in our image here, we show the uh, a tire being inflated. So as you first inflate it, the volume increases. So if you've ever inflated a tire that was almost completely empty, the pressure doesn't change a whole lot, but it will inflate. So it will actually push up a little bit more, but the pressure only increases a small amount. Then as you continue to add air, the pressure will increase drastically, but the volume will not. You note that the tire looks then essentially the same. And now the air is going into adding to the pressure. And if you continue this uh, increase, uh, an increase in temperature, the pressure will increase if the temperature increases. So if you increase the temperature, the pressure will increase. If you decrease the temperature, the pressure will decrease. And you often notice this on your tires, perhaps if you have the tire monitoring systems uh, that are prevalent in cars today, that when it first gets that really cold morning, you can notice that your tire light is on. And if your tires have been inflated for summer temperatures and all of a sudden it is cold in the morning, you'll notice that the pressure has decreased drastically and in fact can easily decrease enough to set off the tire warning light. Um, so we have those here and we also want to relate the, how these are related through the ideal gas law and the ideal gas law states that the pressure times the volume is equal to the number of atoms times K which is the Boltzmann constant down below multiplied by the temperature. So K is just a constant here 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23rd joules per Kelvin and that is called the Boltzmann constant. And then if we know three of these other values the pressure the volume the number of atoms or the temperature if we know any three of those we can then calculate the fourth. So let's look at an example using the ideal gas law. And we have here what we're going to do is to calculate the number of molecules. How many molecules are there in a cubic meter of gas at STP? Remember standard temperature and pressure and remember what those values are. To give an idea of what a cubic meter is, you can see it right here. One meter on either side is about the size of this cubic box. So something uh, something about this size. How many molecules are within that 
uh, that box. And we can actually calculate that at standard temperature and pressure. So let's go ahead and solve our problem uh, based on our methods here that we know. So let's list what we know. And remember, because it's at standard temperature and pressure, we know the temperature is zero degrees Celsius, which is 273 Kelvin. We know that the pressure is 1.05 times 10 to the fifth Pascals. And we know the volume that we're looking at a cubic meter. So the volume is exactly one cubic meter. And we know K Boltzmann's constant. So we know everything now if we write out our ideal gas law equation, we know everything in this equation, except for one thing, because we know the pressure, we know the volume, we know Boltzmann's constant, and we know the temperature. And that means we can calculate the number of molecules. So if we were to do that, our next step would be to solve for the number of molecules and then put in the values that we have and then go ahead and put those into your calculator and calculate them and we would find that there are uh, six 2.68 times 10 to the 25th molecules in one cubic meter of a gas so you know it doesn't matter what the gas is the gas it's independent of that because it only depends on the pressure the volume and the temperature so we can calculate that regardless of whether that were filled with uh, atmospheric gases or filled with pure helium or hydrogen or anything else the number of molecules at standard temperature and pressure would be the same so let's continue and let's look at some of the concepts that we'll come back to in uh, the chemistry section of the class but what we want to look at because we get such a large number of molecules it is a number beyond our comprehension 10 to the 25th how do we comprehend something that is 10 to the 25th we have a hard time a million would be 10 to the sixth that's hard to comprehend a billion is 10 to the ninth a trillion is 10 to the 12th those are large enough so we come up with another unit as we often do to explain very large numbers and in this case we're using what is called the mole and one mole is defined to be the number of atoms in exactly 12 grams of carbon 12. That is the definition of the mole and is also given by the name Avogadro's number or represented by a capital N with a subscript A and it is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules per mole. That is how many molecules are in one mole. So that helps get these numbers down to something a little more manageable. Trying to comprehend such large exponents while we can calculate with them, our brains just don't like to wrap themselves around such large numbers. Now this is for uh, some things for gases there are 22 and a half liters per mole and you can actually go to the textbook if you want to look at example 13.8 to see a little bit about how this comes about I'm not going to go through that here for this class but you can look that up in the textbook to see but it's 22.5 liters per mole for a gas so one 22.5 liters of a gas will represent one mole of that gas okay so we can also look at the ideal gas law can also be written in terms of moles so you can use this we had it as PV equals remember PV equals capital N lowercase k T but we can also write it as PV equals NRT where R is another constant and we can use different sets of units depending on what we're trying to calculate here. So R can have various values depending on what you're given in the problem and what you're trying to figure out. So it's the same type of thing except now N is the number of moles in the substance instead of the number of atoms. Up here it was the number of atoms. Down here it's the number of moles. P and V are the same. R is changed. Now the R is in terms instead of being K is R in terms of moles. So it could be 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin. It could be 1.99 calories per mole Kelvin 
or 0.81 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So there are various different units that you can use here and it really just depends on what you're trying to calculate there. So let's go through one example of this uh, looking at these and we'll look at the example of a bike tire. And what we want to find is how many moles of gas are in a bike tire if it has a volume of 2 times 10 to the negative third cubic meters, a pressure of 7 times 10 to the fifth pascals, and a temperature of 18 degrees Celsius. So put down what we know, and there's the numbers we just, just had. And we want to figure out, based on what we know, we want to use uh, this value for R of 8.31 joule per mole Kelvin because that is what is going to work out with the units for what we have. So we can use this version of the equation and if we solve it we find that N the number of moles is equal to P times V over RT. And if we put in the values that we know we can go ahead and go through all the calculations here. And if we examine our units and what the definition of joules are, we can actually calculate through this and find out that we'll end up with just a number of moles at about 0.579 moles. So within that bicycle tire with a volume of 2 times 10 to the negative third cubic meters, we would find a little over half a mole of material. So we can do other calculations with this again as long as you know everything except for uh, one of the values you can calculate those if you knew the number of moles and you wanted to try to find a temperature you could do that or a volume or a pressure. And just remember when you're looking at these that if you're given standard temperature and pressure that those have very specific values and that's what you want to use. So let's look a little bit summarize our problem solving strategies. First of all, determine that an ideal gas is involved. So for most of our cases, if it's talking about a gas, unless it tells you it's not ideal for our cases, it will be an ideal gas. Uh, list your known values, make sure you're converting to SI units, sometimes they can be given in different values. Determine your unknown, what are you looking for? Decide which form of the ideal gas law do you want to use? Do you know molecules or do you know moles? That's going to tell you, give you a good hint as to what version of the ideal gas law you need. You will need to manipulate and rearrange the equation to solve for your unknown what you're looking for. And then of course you substitute in known values and make sure that the answer is reasonable. So if you're finding that a tire contains many billions of moles of material, we probably know that something is quite wrong. Or if you find out that a cubic meter has exactly 10 add 10 molecules in it, then we know that something is quite wrong. So it's good to at least eliminate anything that is very obviously wrong with your calculation with your with your answer. Very good way to come back and look at things and compare and make sure you are on the right track. So the last thing I want to look at here briefly are what we call phase diagrams. So matter can be in one of three phases solid, liquid or gas. Now we're familiar with that for water because water we see as a solid in terms of ice as a liquid and also as a water vapor in terms of a gas. What a phase diagram does is plot temperature and we see that here on the x axis and pressure which we see on the y axis here. So this is the temperature in degrees Celsius. This is the uh, pressure in atmospheres. So depending on where you are on this if you're on this side off to the right this is all vapor. So you will get vapor over there that is all water vapor on this side and that is to, could be at a very high temperature or a low temperature. Now we think of water vapor as only being at a high temperature but water vapor can be at much lower temperatures as well as you see here. You could get water vapor at extremely cold temperatures down uh, below the freezing what we call the freezing point of water if the pressure is low enough. 
So that so you can get vapor at all sorts of anything in this range over here below this line will give you water vapor. On the far left side, you have the solid area. So this will give you solid ice, which is present at very only at very cold temperatures. But depends again a little bit on the pressure exactly where that falls depends a little bit on the pressures. And then finally, you get the liquid phase. Liquid phase can, can, is re, it limits to a very specific region of temperature and pressure. So liquid water, while very plentiful on the Earth, only occurs because we happen to be in that very specific range of about one atmosphere and a certain number of degree average temperature of the Earth somewhere in here. So we end up with a good amount of water present on Earth in, in a liquid form. However, the liquid can be present even at very much higher temperatures. Normally, remember, it boils here at 100 degrees. However, you see that you can have a liquid at more than 100 degrees if the pressure is high enough. So as you go up higher, you can have liquids up here at much higher temperatures going up to several hundred degrees Celsius as long as you have extremely high pressures. And that happens until you reach the critical point. At the critical point, the liquid phase no longer exists. So once you pass that temperature and that pressure above this, you have no more liquid phase and it goes directly from a solid over here into a gas. So that will undergo a process we call sublimation. And that is a phase change of solid to gas. And you may be familiar with that with something called dry ice. Dry ice is solid carbon dioxide, CO2, and carbon dioxide at the pressure and temperature of the Earth would be beyond the critical point. So it goes directly from a solid into a gas. And that's why we call it dry ice. It doesn't have that liquid phase. It doesn't melt the way water ice does. So that's if you go beyond the critical point. And then there's the triple point here, which is the one point where all three phases can exist simultaneously. At normal temperatures and pressures on Earth, you can't get all three phases at once. You have to be at a very low temperature here, but you also have to be at a very low pressure for water. But if you were at those two, then you could actually get water as a solid, a liquid, and a gas all at once. So a phase diagram is a good way of summarizing and detailing all of that information in one diagram. So let's go ahead and summarize and finish up this section of the lecture. And what we found that we talked about was the ideal gas law which related the pressure, the temperature, and the volume of an ideal gas. We talked about Avogadro's number, which gives the number of molecules in a specified quantity of matter. So it tells us how many molecules there are. And then we finished up looking at phase diagrams, which shows the temp at what temperatures and pressures, pressures the different phases, solid, liquid, and gas will exist. So that concludes this lecture on the ideal gas law. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone, and I will see you in class.